Good morning. I'm David Flynn. I am the uh, CEO of the company Hammerspace. Um, how many of you uh, were in the session yesterday where I was given kind of the first part? Okay, good. Um, this kind of builds on that, so, uh, but I'll do a brief review for those who uh, weren't there. Um, so, uh, Parallel NFS, Hammerspace has commercialized Parallel NFS, not just to solve the challenge of performance, which is what ostensibly it was designed for, but also as a way to decouple data from the storage by allowing all different types of storage systems and services to house the data while the data presentation layer, the file system, covers all of it. So think of it a, as a file system that sits on top, stacks on top of other file systems. Um, that's part of what makes it parallel is it can provide direct concurrent access to many of these underlying systems. And it helps to solve not just performance, but the ability for data now to move freely across different uh, infrastructure assets in a vendor agnostic, location agnostic fashion. Also allows you to do software to find. It's facilitated by the fact that Linux is now ubiquitous, so we can put sophistication into the Linux, into the NFS client, because I don't have to put it into six different types of, of Unix, like in the past with AIX and HPUX and Solaris and blah, blah, blah. Now the only thing that matters is Linux. It forms a great foundation for it. So NFS 4.2 allows us uh, to to um, achieve these goals in a standards-based fashion. And in essence, for the first time, combine the high-performance parallel file system world that came from supercomputing with Enterprise NAS as a new form of Enterprise NAS with all of the standards and features of Enterprise NAS combined with the high performance and capabilities of, of uh, the uh, supercomputing scalable file systems and combine that with the data orchestration capabilities. So this was kind of the, the culmination of the architecture diagram from yesterday. The anvil uh, towards the middle are the metadata servers. So this is depicting two different data centers. Uh, we can do dozens of data centers combined in a, in a system. Um, but we're depicting two here. Uh, each data center uh, is self-standing uh, with its own uh, file system serving. You're able to use any form of third-party storage or system. Uh, the metadata server and the data service nodes, DSX, do all of the data moving, protocol translations that may be involved. Really easy to think of the difference there. Anvil is the brain, and DSX are the hands and fingers. Um, the Anvil never touches the contents of files, whereas most of the time, the contents of the files are directly addressed in the underlying storage, hence parallel NFS. But when you need to do protocol translation, when you need data moving, then the DSX nodes get involved, or when you need to put a, a, a file uh, front end on top of block storage. You'll remember that from yesterday's talk. Now we get to the new stuff. So <clears throat> let me start with a bit of history that uh, I was privileged to be involved in with Fusion IO. Uh, more than a decade ago, Flash had become uh, a volume commodity product thanks to consumer electronics, but it had not yet made its way back up into corporate data centers. Uh, we were still using disk drives. And uh, I founded the company Fusion IO with the idea that instead of having the SSD pretending to be a disk drive behind a RAID controller, which it could easily oversaturate, we should get rid of at least one of the three data retransmissions and eliminate the RAID controller. In essence, that's what NVMe does is it uh, disintermediates the RAID controller and the traditional storage bus, uh, ATA, uh, SATA, SAS bus, and protocol. Uh, 
And that allows you to get uh, much higher performance. As we all know, NVMe is now the most uh, prevalent uh, form factor, prevalent connectivity for SSDs. And it's going to be a 400 billion a year market by um, 25. So big business in PCI Express uh, or PCIe uh, flash, NVMe flash, sorry. But so we get rid of the RAID controller, that's step number one. Now we only have two times that the data gets uh, shipped over the bus. Um, so NVIDIA introduced GPU Direct, which is a way to transfer data. This is more logical than physical, but transfer data logically directly across PCI Express into the GPUs. Um, so uh, we've worked really, really hard to get rid of two of the three um, retransmissions of data, each with its own need for flow control, et cetera, and now we can get uh, much higher bandwidth, lower latency access between the flash and the GPU. This is all well and good, um, but what about when you want to do shared storage? This is for local direct attached, local file system, local access. What if I want to do a shared data? Now you have to start looking at, well, what does it take to make the data presentation layer, to make the file system? There are actually, um, if we start at the very bottom with Flash, there are actually three layers. You've got the FTL that's mapping blocks to addresses on the Flash, and then you also have the thing which is mapping um, the file offset to what block that is on the block device, and then you have the namespace that's mapping the file name uh, to the inode number into its contents. That one's somewhat different than the others, but these are all mapping layers. Directory entry to the inode, the inode to the offset, the offset to the flash address. Three different layers to ultimately be able to get to that piece of data in the file foo. Now, um, if you say, well, I want to do this in a shared fashion, say, uh, uh, NAS, this is what it looks like. Um, it's pretty crazy. It's nine times now that the data has to be retransmitted. You basically have back-end nodes that store the data, front-end node that applies the file system. And this is the architecture that you have today with NetApp uh, cluster mode, with Isilon, with pure Cumulo, any scale-out NAS, traditional scale-out NAS is going to do this. This is why, for example, uh, the Isilon folks used InfiniBand internally, because as you can see, that's a lot of hops. We want to use something that's lower latency, right? So um, between the, the front-end nodes and the back-end nodes of a Isilon, you had InfiniBand internally. This is still extremely costly from a number of times the data has to be retransmitted, the, the implication that that has on latency, et cetera. So the industry said, well, we can improve on this. Let's go and eliminate the CPU and memory in the back end by introducing this thing called NVMe over fabrics. You guys are all familiar with the NVMe OF. It's really a way to get the data from the NVMe out the NIC uh, without the CPU having to be involved uh, with flow control or copy of the data in and out of memory of the underlying thing. So NVMe over fabrics, if we look at that you know, here, we've got now a some sort of a fabric, i.e. InfiniBand, maybe Ethernet uh, with Rocky, and that allows the file front end to access these blocks, uh, in a, these shared blocks. So we basically created a shared block layer, and now we have the file layer on top of that. Using NVMe over fabrics, it reduces the uh, delay uh, that it takes to get at that. Any questions so far on this? Is this all? jiving with your perception of it? Okay, good. Um, 
this still sucks. We've got eight times that the data has to be retransmitted. By the way, this is, this is the vast architecture. Newfangled, they're using NVMe over fabrics. So, you know, the entire difference is we go from nine to eight because we're using NVMe over fabrics instead of, instead of uh, not. Um, not a huge improvement. So you've heard me talk a lot about parallel file system, parallel file system architecture. It is not the same thing as scale out and scale out NAS. This is scale out NAS, and this is the most modern incarnation of scale out NAS. Parallel file systems look like this. They take the entire file system front end and shift it to the side and allow the data path to be direct. This is now speaking NFS v3, and down here we have a simple file system, and up here we have a sideband metadata controller. It's not in the data path. That's why I depict two lines here, but it could be hundreds or even thousands. We do have customers today that have on the order of a thousand storage nodes in one system capable of 100 plus terabits per second. You're not gonna do that in a scale-out NAS architecture. This is the architecture that you would find in a file system like Lustre uh, in the supercomputing world. What it does is it takes the directory entry to, to inode mapping and does it on the side. And it depends on a considerable amount more sophistication in the client to be able to do this because now the client has to be involved in the, let's call it the data routing function. It's gonna do a look aside lookup, get a layout, and then connect and talk directly to one of N storage nodes. So this is why I say that the fact that Linux won the Unix wars and is now the only real NFS client that matters allows us to invest more effort in making an NFS client that can uh, take on uh, this additional sophistication and role uh, and do the data routing directly. That allows us to eliminate an entire uh, additional layer of networking. Questions? So they aren't the ones that are at scale. That's a good question. Uh, yeah, the question was, are we ignoring Microsoft and uh, the SMB world? And the answer is yes and no. Um, this is talking about where we're doing high performance clustering like AI workloads, rendering workloads, et cetera. Um, you can serve uh, traditional SMB and even legacy NFS v3 um, by having by introducing that layer back and translating the protocol, which is in essence, in essence what the DSX node can do when it bridges from being an NFS 4.2 client to being a SMB server. But it is no worse than this. So for legacy protocols, you get this, and the DSX node is actually paying, playing this role here. Um, but for the Linux world, presumably anybody who is concerned about, you know, this kind of scalability and performance is going to be using uh, Linux in the data center. Great question, though. Yeah. Any other questions? So the client functionality is upstream. Uh, yes, I <laughs> keep doing that. Um, are we planning on putting the client functionality upstream? And the answer is that the client functionality has been upstream since RHEL 7, uh, 7 9. So there's no change with what's in there. Right. There are a number of fixes that didn't make it into RHEL 7, which is now all buttoned up. So better to be on RHEL 8 to be able to get the additional fixes. But those are only for some of the more sophisticated functionalities. Baseline functionality works in RHEL 7, out of the box. Um, but great question. And uh, again, I, for those of you who might not have been here yesterday, um, 
we have the advantage that our CTO is Tron Dmickelbust, the uh, kernel maintainer of the NFS stack, the client stack. So um, he's been the maintainer for the last 20 years. Um, this has been uh, made possible by the fact that he uh, has been able to get that stuff done upstream. Yeah. And don't you love the coincidence? How many other folks caught the, uh, caught the connection between the last name Flynn and our CTO Tron? <laughs> the movie Tron. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so NFS 4.2 stands to eliminate um, four of those nine transmissions, leaving uh, only five remaining uh, using an architecture like this. And as I was pointing out yesterday, um, this is Linux off the shelf. And this is Linux off the shelf. You don't need anything from Hammerspace on the end storage nodes or your clients. Um, this uh, Hammerspace can sit off to the side with the control plane and the data service nodes to move things around, uh, but the bulk of the environment is just off the shelf Linux, both on the storage node server side and the client side. That's a game changer. Uh, you know, one of the drawbacks of parallel file systems is that they come with uh, custom clients that you have to worry about, you know, what version goes in your kernel and all of that. And here, I don't even have to dictate the kernel version of the storage node, much less the kernel version or capabilities on the, um, on the client. Here, you're just using KNFSD and a local file system. These are all just local file systems. But because they have the local file system, we have offloaded into that storage node one additional very important function, the, the file offset to block mapping, the, um, the chaining of blocks into to make up the body of, of files. That block allocation and mapping function is what you want to be able to be done in each of the end storage nodes, right? So we split, so the directory entry mapping is up here, the file offset block mapping is down here. And so that is the magic of parallel file systems, is splitting the two layers of metadata in a file system. Namespace metadata, block address mapping metadata. And have the block address mapping metadata be done in times be pushed down into the storage nodes. Something you can't do if they have a block interface. It has to be something more sophisticated than block interface. In this case, it's a local file system that stacks neatly underneath the parallel file system. Not unlike the OSD, T10 OSD stuff, or the uh, uh, Luster, Luster OSS, you know, all that. It's just in our world, anything that's NFS, V3, the least common denominator of all NFS, is a storage node. Because it turns out NFS is a superset of what it takes to talk file. So of course it can do the data path, it's just using it in a somewhat of a degenerate fashion. Down there, they're just numbered blobs. It has a file system down there. If you go to look at it, you can actually navigate it. It's just a, a nested directory structure with, with numbered files. Those numbers represent the object ID. So there is, down here, none of the namespace. Uh, it's just object IDs. But we use the, the same file system, and you, like I said, you could log in and mount those and look at them. It makes a really convenient way to do it. And you can see your object namespace. In other words, we didn't have to create a new standard like T10 OSD uh, or whatever to get this. We, we already had what we needed to speak to the bodies of files because NFS is a superset of what it takes to speak to file systems generally. All right, any questions? What's the local file system down there? So what, uh, what it could be anything. Uh, what is the local file system that's used down on the uh, storage nodes? Um, the one that we bundle as part of DSX, if you're using our software appliance for that function, what we bundle is XFS. Um, and about, oh, five years ago, we commissioned Christoph Helwig uh, to 
implement CP RefLink. CP RefLink is the ability to do clone, copy on write cloning of files. Uh, and that allows us to implement snapshots and clones at the file system level, uh, at the NFS 4.2 level, and delegate the copy on write of the actual contents of files down onto the storage nodes. So um, it allows us to offer enterprise data services, snapshots and clones, et cetera, by having enhanced XFS. Arguably, well, I think it's beyond argument actually, XFS is the best file system out there when it comes to doing high performance block allocation and mapping. It is the fastest. Uh, it's, you know, the EXT line has, has still not, not even come close to touching it. And ZFS, forget about it. Now, XFS does not do a lot of the data integrity stuff uh, that you might get with ZFS, and it doesn't pretend to be a volume manager. So you might want to stack MD or, or um, uh, you know, to do striping, mirroring, or MD verify to do data integrity kind of stuff. Or you could use ZFS, but again, ZFS isn't even a native part of Linux, so kind of not a great choice there. Um, uh, but so yeah, we recommend XFS is, is the one that we typically, it's, it's so efficient by the way, we've got customers that are using dual 200 gigabit NICs in ethernet mode, so not RDMA. So it's still got all the overhead of running the TCP IP stack and have you know, a dozen or so NVMe drives and they're able to saturate 90 plus percent of the network with the CPUs on even a low, low horsepower box, not even breaking a sweat. It doesn't take really anything from a processing perspective uh, to apply the XFS file system as your block allocator and mapping function and export that with the kernel NFS server and get that out the wire at basically full performance of that wire. It's, the CPUs aren't even breaking a sweat. I don't think you could buy a root complex small enough to where it would be a measurable uh, amount of, uh, you know, where it would be occupying the CPUs too much. Which brings me to the proposal and the reason why all of the stage up here is once you've gotten to this architecture, it will make a lot of sense to collapse this whole thing into the SSD and have the SSD just have a couple of two or four ARM cores run the XFS file system, export it out Ethernet. Um, and there's no doubt, doesn't take much horsepower here to be able to, to saturate 100 gigabit links uh, off of the thing. So this is really the, the vision for the future and I, I do think that um, um, challenges of getting to volume aside, this architecture has many, many advantages that will be um, uh, undeniable people won't be able to pass up. It'll change fundamentally data center architecture when you don't have to put SSDs into a server just to have the server connect to the network. You can get rid of all of those additional copies. So now we are down to three. The data path is only three times that the data has to be transmitted chip to chip or over a wire. I'm assuming the network is cut through and largely doesn't count. There might be additional hops if you're using a, a thick network, lots of layers, but it's cut through generally. Questions? Let me go to the, so here's, um, once you've put that down in the SSD, then for the first time, the SSD is in possession of the block mappings into files. It can understand what is contents of file. And um, because of that, you can eliminate the dual mapping of block file offset to block, block to flash. You could go directly. Your FTL and the block allocation of the file system can converge into one mapping layer. 
which gets rid of the additional layer of metadata lookup where you're looking up all of those mappings. And it means that you can get to the flash, you know, probably with one less access, cut the latency in half. Because you only have to go and do the mapping lookup once, not twice. Questions? All right. So, um, yes. Um, in Hammerspace? Uh, what was the question? Uh, can you do a reverse lookup? So if I have the, um, the object ID of the body of the file on the underlying storage node, uh, can I look it up uh, what file it belongs to, basically? The answer is yes, but it's not an indexed lookup. Um, we don't need to do any of that at speed, so we're not maintaining indexes in the reverse direction. So the data is all there, it's just not indexed for a reverse lookup like that. Yeah. Yes? Oh, is, uh, just actually a couple of questions. So, so firstly, uh, is there any persistence on the metadata? So yes, the metadata server actually does have persistence. I'm sorry, uh, I keep doing that. Yes. Does the metadata server have any persistence? And uh, yes, the answer is yes, it does. Um, and uh, that is today stored on local NVMe and replicated at the key value store level between multiple nodes. So its persistence is node local. Metadata is not somehow stored on that. No, no. It's a node local thing that's mirrored at the metadata database level. And if I were to mount one of those NFS3 SSDs, right, whatever you have there, it's it's not going to be usable, right? So if you were to go look down there, you would just see numbered f numbers in a, a directory structure. It, it wouldn't make any sense to it. Uh, that's right. Um, it is just an object store. It's storing objects, numbered objects. Of course, back. T10 OSD, object storage meant one thing. Now object storage means REST interfaces to uh, global scale stuff. But um, I mean the, the cla let's call it a blob store. It's just a blob store. Yeah, and just to drive home, so the redundancy, let's say one of those NFS is three SFDs for a fail, for example, XFS goes. The redundancy, yeah. Uh, uh, so the redundancy is handled in multiple ways. Um, the, the question is about how do you handle redundancy? across them. And uh, two things. Uh, you, you may remember from the talk yesterday that we, one of the features we added to the NFS 4.2 client is synchronous mirrored writing, NWAY. And that allows you to write redundantly to multiple. That's rather costly from a, cap a capacity perspective. Um, the uh, new spec and implementation is to allow an agent which could live on the client or could live down here that could do the one to n erasure coding. Basically pretend to be one file but scatter the data across to n. That agent could be anywhere in the data path, on the client, on the storage node, or in an intermediate thing if you wanted to. But it does make a lot of sense to co-locate it at either the client or the server. And it's really just a, it's just a proxy it speaks NFS v3 out the top, and it scatters the data out NFS v3 out the bottom to the, the different nodes. So that erasure coding is uh, a technology that we acquired from the company Rozo. I don't know if you know Rozo FS. They use uh, a very sophisticated, well, it's instead of Reed Solomon and all of the crunching overhead of that, they use, a, uh, I think it's called a geometric code. And let me explain, this, this has extreme relevance here. Reed Solomon is, what's the term for it when it's a minimal? It, it, like if I take a block that's 512 bytes, it puts the parities into exactly 512 bytes. First to second, however many parities you make, right? Um, if you can relax that to where instead of 512, it's 513 or 514, then you can use simple XOR. And because we're doing the, um, because we're not pretending to 
offer a block interface, you know, blocks have to be 4K or 512 bytes. Blocks have to be that size, and you have to fit stuff into that size. So when you're doing erasure coding at the block layer, you're pretty much locked into having to use Reed Solomon or another minimal code that fits 512 into exactly 512 byte parities. But when you're doing the erasure coding at a file offset level with sections of a file, it's okay if it's slightly bloated, if you add a couple of bytes for every sector or for every four, 512. And that's exactly what uh, we depend on is that you know, the file system down here can do a pretty good job of, of handling the misalignments, the, any read, modify, and write kind of stuff handled down here is basically free. So that allows the erasure coding to not have to have perfect packing and it allows you to use something that is no more than a simple XOR. Just like the first parity, your second, your third, and your fourth are all just simple XOR, which means it can be done at the rate of a mem copy, as fast as you can run through the memory. You're not having to do basically any crunching on it. Yes? Very good question, yeah. Yep, yeah. So, um, the, the, to handle, what was the, question? the question was, um, if you have many clients writing to the same file, um, how do you handle the um, erasure coding being done at the client if, they're all, if, they're, if they happen to be handling adjacent data within the same encoding, now they're gonna have to read, modify, write, they're gonna contend with each other. And the answer here is it's two things. Number one, we introduce to the protocol striping. So it's possible for uh, the NFS client to send different stripes to different NFS v3 servers. Those NFS v3 servers can be these encoding agents. So stripe one goes to this agent, stripe two goes to this agent, stripe three goes to this agent. And that would induce client to client communication because anybody who's doing a stripe one sector will end up sending his data to the guy who's handling that. And anybody who's doing stripe two would handle to that one. So basically you have you, instead of having one centralized one or many uncoordinated that will stomp on each other, you have many of them that have coordinated by divvying up the address space with striping uh, and that allows you to take uh, client to client east-west bandwidth to potentially funnel it in, perform the erasure code and send it. That's if you want to do it client side. If you want to do it storage node side, then that agent runs down there and it's storage node to storage node where the exchange happens. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's, there's another reason um, that that comes in and that is, um, for example, this um, um, hyperscaler that we're working with in their AI infrastructure, the one that's using this with thousands of storage nodes. Um, they don't happen to have RDMA capability on the back end to the storage nodes, but they do have RDMA between all of their GPU nodes. And they do have NVMe in each of their GPU nodes. And because this approach doesn't require anything more than Linux, which they're already running, for both the storage server and the client, they can have each of those GPU nodes be both a storage server node and a client node. Also aided by the fact that XFS and KNFSD are so efficient 
that the overhead and tax on the node is negligible, sub 10%. Uh, for, for participating. This allows you to do a hyper-converged kind of model where you've aggregated the storage among those nodes. And in this case, that allows them to use the RDMA capability uh, uh, to feed GPU direct uh, in, in between them. So I guess what I'm getting at is that um, there are reasons things have changed a bit when it's all standard and built into Linux to have these agents and services be able to be located where it can make sense from a topology perspective of the environment. But you ought to be able to pick and choose where it is. And the way I envision it, this is really not that much different from a, I guess the term is DPU, right, which is really just a fancy name for a lighter weight non x86 root complex it's a it's an arm thing a more embedded thing if your dpu is running is running linux it's just an alternate architecture server node maybe lighter weight and this is saying well the ssd is your dpu then it has that that capability as a matter of fact you could uh, use linux on that soc and have it be even able to host containers and run stuff that benefits from being down closer embedded with the flash. So the net benefit of this, some of these things are obvious, lower latency. Um, it is the number of times the data has to be retransmitted that determines power consumption. How many times of having to redrive that data out over uh, traces or, or cables. Um, so lower power consumption is a direct result. Um, and of course, this all feeds into lower capital and operational costs. Um, you get lower write amplification because now the block allocation mapping is next to the FTL. Any trim-related stuff is actually, you know, can be handled within the SSD. It is aware of file contents. So it would trim itself based on the file layout. Um, and as you get higher and higher capacity density, you need nothing more than to make sure your network is full by section bandwidth to be able to aggregate the full bandwidth of it. So you're not gonna sacrifice performance to capacity density, right? Because it's uh, cheap enough, network ports are cheap enough that you can keep uh, the full bandwidth uh, available. And all of this boils down to higher access density. Um, and one not to be left out is the system is inherently more reliable the more you get rid of the uh, extra you know, times the data has to be retransmitted. Um, but this one is a surprising one. The ability to not just scale up to massive scale, but to scale down to something that could be used by somebody with a workstation at home. Plug in a couple of these. What gets really interesting is that USB-C is basically 10 gigabit Ethernet. It, it's 10 gigabit USB-C, and you can use it as a peer-to-peer -peer network. So these devices could be just simple consumer USB-C connectors, and you're aggregating 10 gigabit nodes. So building uh, these uh, NFS SSDs would have value in their own right as mini NAS devices. You wouldn't need the NFS 4.2 or hammer space. Somebody could plug it in and, and they've got a file server. Plug in many of them and run the hammer space metadata server and you've got a, a parallel and reliable environment out of it. So the ability to have dynamic range down to something that could tap into consumer demand or at least you know, uh, small office, home office kind of stuff means that this has a chance to be th the mainstream way to do it. And of course, I alluded to this, but more explicitly, with this, you've enabled computational storage. Because the first thing you need before you can embed more sophisticated computation capabilities in the storage devices is awareness of the block mapping, the file offset to block. You've got to be able to talk about contents of stuff. If you go to these conferences where they present research around offloading things down into the storage devices, 
every single talk starts with, well, the first thing we had to solve is how to get the block mapping so we know what blocks to be operating on. And basically, they end up having to, to pull all of that block allocation mapping, file offset to block mapping stuff down there enough that they know how to work on it. Another way to say this is that all of these other functions are subordinate to the one main function of chaining blocks together to make a body or a blob of a file. That is the first thing you have to do. Yes? If you do the erasure coding, um, well, if erasure coding, you know, scattering, that's going to cause, but at least it is algorithmic and pattern based, right? Um, but um, the, uh, the question, sorry, I didn't repeat it. I should have repeated it. The, the question was, you're still going to have to do the, um, um, sorry, I lost. The what now? Yeah. Oh, presumably somebody has to communicate the file offsets to you, right? But that's, I mean, that, yeah, it's presumed, somebody's going to have to tell you the file offsets, but at least you can get from the file offset to the, to the block. Yeah. Uh, yes, somebody's going to have to take the overall function and map it to which object and which offsets and what function. But it doesn't have to worry about how does that map to block. And, and that's the thing that is bigger and bulkier. I mean, the, the presumably giving the schema, let's call it the schema of the file and which file it is, um, the schema is something that uh, can be pattern-based or, I mean, it's a, it's a schema. It's not the actual, this block is this, this block is this, this. I'm not having to communicate a mapping, I'm having to communicate a schema. In other words, it's algorithmic, formulaic, et cetera. Even with the erasure coding and others, it's, it's so, so it's an order of magnitude less complex and something you would presume that the, the agent that's going to farm out this work is going to talk about and give you that, um, which object and what schema to use when interacting with it. But great question. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, other than mapping, there are other things happening on the file, uh, what the data is, compression, encryption. Yeah, these kinds of things, yeah. So all that happens at different levels. So in this world, it can happen. Uh, it's, let's take compression for an example. Compression you can't do with a block device because a block device has to advertise how many blocks it's going to have. It's not elastic in its capacity. So at a file level, now I can have compression and I can do encryption that's different keys based on different files. So now we can start, we can work at a higher semantic, a higher logical level. So uh, uh, wrapping up here, uh, why does this need to happen now? Why is it likely to happen now? Because AI ML is making HPC go mainstream. Performance demands are becoming mainstream demands. Data governance, cloud computing, the need to aggregate large number of tenants on shared infrastructure. Um, the performance of Flash has the correct parity to the performance of networking. You don't need an intermediate aggregation layer to justify it. Um, You've got the form factors with the available power, right? The, these form factors have been standardized, thanks to folks like SNEA. You have IP that's available with 64-bit processors and plenty of transistor density to get to the performance levels. It's not hard to get embedded performance to achieve this. You have network address range to do it. In an old IPv4 world, you would not do this because you couldn't address as many of these devices as you might have. And the ability to embed Linux with all of the technologies you need like XFS, KNFSD, and the last, of course, is that you have standardized NFS 4.2 to where you can put a file system of file systems on top of it and have it be useful at a macro level. All right. Any questions? Yes? Yeah, do you have any uh, perspective for the four factors that you um, 
The, do we have any perspective on the form factors? Uh, I think the first place that this would be useful um, in a, to try to catch enough volume to merit the, the work, I think we'll be talking um, the um, um, form factors like, like the E1.S, if I'm not mistaken, some of these that have uh, enough uh, power envelope to them. Good question, I'm not sure. Uh, I like the form factor of USB-C connected home devices. I think that's going to be very cool. But um, the, uh, in the data center, it's going to be, I believe there are actually some already spec. There is a spec for these form factors with Ethernet out them. And I know there are vendors who've built chassis that have dual rail switching with, uh, with these slots that plug in over Ethernet. So there is work that's been done this way. All right. Well, I'll be available to chat for anybody who'd like to. Thank you so much for t taking the time to be in the session.